Okay. Well, welcome everybody. This is Elliot Baker, your host at the CISO Sandbox Thought Leadership Series by Hawks Hunt. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Dave Chatterjee, the, the author of Security Readiness. It's a fantastic book, and there's going to be a opportunity to purchase this book on sale. We'll be uh, promoting this. Everybody who attends or signed, signed up to attend, you'll get a link to how to get this fantastic book that is much more than you would imagine, seeing as uh, Dr. Chatterjee is a scholar. You might expect this to be somewhat of a, uh, a stuffy tomb, but what it is, it's actually exciting. It's a, it's a series of case studies, very relatable, very easily uh, readable for people who are experts in the field and also for people who are just really interested in the field. So again, if you haven't read this, I would recommend for everybody to read this book and we'll talk more about this as it relates to our topic today. Uh, which is building a holistic cybersecurity design and how that can start with security and culture. But before we get into that, Dr. Chatterjee, welcome. And uh, please tell the audience about yourself. Well, thank you very much for the invite. I'd like to welcome the attendees. Uh, briefly about myself, um, as, as Elliot said, I'm the author of Cybersecurity Readiness a holistic and high performance approach. The book was published last year. Uh, Sage is the, is the publisher. I also host the Cybersecurity Readiness podcast series, which has a listing base in 69 plus countries. And it's a great way of getting to talk to subject matter experts and stay on top of things. Um, I have been in academia for a while. I'm a professor at the University of Georgia, Terry College of Business, Department of Management Information Systems. I also hold a visiting professorship appointment at Duke University, where I taught the Master of Cybersecurity program in their engineering school in spring of this year. I've been doing cybersecurity research for this last several years. I've also been part of a CISO think tank, a CISO SWAT team, which allows me to gain as much actionable insights as possible. So I have tried to balance my role as a researcher without losing practice focus. I appreciate the kind words about the book by Elliot. And actually that is reflective of the intent when I decided to write the book. And I made it very clear to the publisher that I did not want this to be an academic textbook with chapters and questions. I wanted this to be a guide that practitioners could use to assess their environment and, and identify opportunities for improvement. Also get a reaffirmation of what are the things they are doing well. I would like to believe that it's written in a manner and a fashion, which is very relatable. Uh, you don't have to be very technically savvy to get the most out of the book. And finally, I, I present a framework, I call it the Commitment, Preparedness and Discipline Framework, which also comes out of research. And I would like to believe that that complements the well-known frameworks such as NIST, because the frameworks that's, that, that's out there, they're all great by the way, but I believe their focus is more on the, tech, on the technical and the operational aspect of security. In my framework, I made it a point to add on the behavioral dimension, the managerial dimension, because I firmly believe that to operate at a high level of readiness, an organization must have in place a certain culture, a certain mindset which has to be nurtured over a period of time. Cyber, cybersecurity is not, not something you start and you do, and then you drop it, or 
it takes on a low priority because the revenue is not there. Cybersecurity has to be approached as a critical competency, as a core capability. And I'm glad that senior leadership recognizes that. So it is not something that you outsource and you expect great results. There's nothing wrong in outsourcing. There are specialists out there who have been trained to do cyber, cyber operations as effectively as possible. But that has to be backed by organization-wide support, organization-wide involvement. There is a reason why you hear the phrase quite often that cybersecurity is everybody's business. It really is. The best thing that I can bring up here to make that point even more emphatically is the pandemic. We have the scientists, we have the healthcare professionals who are leading the charge, but each one of us has to do our part. The cybersecurity epidemic, which has been around longer than the pandemic, and its consequences can be even more drastic, can be even more disastrous, has to be handled in a very organized manner where everyone has to play their role. So with that, I'll pause, Elliot. Uh, I don't want to keep going on. I'd like you to jump in with questions, comments, reactions. Absolutely. And uh, I would also encourage the audience, if you do have any questions or comments, please do feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, this is an interactive uh, conversation here. So you are encouraged and more than welcome to uh, participate. Well, you, you said something there that imme immediately uh, I wanted to reflect back to you, and that was that you wanted to complement the, the NIST uh, framework. And so you mentioned that there was uh, a piece missing in your in your scholarly opinion that uh, had to do with the behavior part, the human part of this. So let me ask you this: your your the name of your book, Cybersecurity Res uh, Readiness, is uh, has a subtitle: A Holistic and High Performance Approach. That brings us into really the the crux of this whole talk here: is what is a holistic design? Absolutely. In fact, it might be useful if I could pull up a particular slide while I talk about it. Please so, do. Yeah, please so, do. so shall I share? Yeah, I'd be happy if you did. That'd be great. Uh, let me see if I can see the share screen here. Uh, yeah, I, I can. Okay. Yep, I see it. Okay, so I'm gonna flip through some slides here. And I just wanted the, the audience, the attendees to know that we will be sharing a copy of the slide deck. So you have something to go away with over and above whatever you picked up from the conversation. So this is the framework that I discuss in my book. So, when uh, Elliot talks about what's the grand design, the grand design for creating a high performance information security culture is anchored on three pillars, commitment, preparedness, and discipline. If you look at the commitment slide, and I know the, it's not, the resolution may not be great, but you will get a copy of it. There are seven factors fine. here, such as hands-on top management. We are in it together culture, cross-functional participation, strategic alignment and partnership, sustainable budget, empowerment, joint ownership and accountability. So I'm gonna use these seven factors as an example of how this framework adds to the existing frameworks out there. And I want to reiterate again that I am not a fan of criticizing the great work 
that people are doing in different ways. So I complement the existing frameworks. And I hope that organizations will find this framework a valuable add-on. And that's the kind of feedback I have been receiving. So, so in other words, while the, the frameworks that are out there, they focus on the preparedness aspect very well, which includes the variety of technical controls. And that's great. But the big picture is, how do you maintain a certain level of execution, consistency, and quality unless you have top management involvement? So that begs the question, how do you get top management to be actively engaged? How do you get top management to be proactive? In one of my recent podcasts, I was having a discussion with a very distinguished CISO of a European company. And she said clearly that her experience has been that unfortunately, the leadership are kind of reactive. They're compliance driven. Let's check the box. Let's get the certificate so we can operate. And there's nothing wrong with that practical approach. But I believe we have to go a little bit further. I, in fact, every opportunity I get to, to speak to the C-suite folks, I emphasize the importance of a genuine commitment, substantive involvement, where they truly care, because that percolates throughout the organization. When organization members recognize, realize that being secure or doing your part to secure the organization and their stakeholders is very important to the leadership team, they will do their part. So leadership plays a hugely important role. In fact, I'd like to put in a plug for an article of mine that has just been published in a reputed uh, journal that comes out of the IMD Institute in Lausanne, Switzerland. And at some point, I'd like to share that with the audience as well, where I talk Great. about how top management can be actively involved. What are the different roles they can play? So that's one example of the managerial, the behavioral side that needs to support the traditional controls-driven approach because you cannot sustain a controls-driven driven approach unless you have a very supportive information security culture, information security environment. Once again, I want to pause and let you respond, react before I keep going. No, I think this makes a lot of sense as you're going through this here. Uh, there are so many pillars to this whole thing. And I'm curious if you are still seeing people taking a non-holistic approach and what that looks like. So Elliot, a non-holistic approach, as I just said, would be a controls, a technical controls driven approach where you basically make sure that all the required controls, and I think I, it's not fair for me to just say technical, I think technical, physical, administrative controls, they are being addressed. So to be, to be, um, to be fair. But they are being addressed in the in the context of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. That that is a requirement that is important, but that is not sufficient. Let me give you an example. Let's take the example of training, creating awareness, providing training. Now. There are regulations, there are frameworks out there which specify that you need to offer a certain type of training, so on and so forth. But what I have observed, I have experienced is not many organizations are really involved in offering very effective training. So what do I mean by very effective training? Very effective training let me get to a slide here. 
if I may, to highlight that. Great, please do. You're definitely speaking to a uh, particular area of interest for our audience here when we're talking about training and awareness. So I'm, I'm happy that this uh, conversation went in this direction. Awesome. And you know what? This is such an important conversation. Like I said, we cannot afford to ignore the non-cybersecurity professionals in an organization. It's not enough to hire cybersecurity folks and expect them to do everything for us. We have to raise the overall level of cyber awareness amongst the non-tech, the non-security people. So in other words, the training needs to be very customized, very role-based. It cannot be a one-shot, six-monthly training. The training has to be continuous. The training has to be incremental. In the article that's just come out, I talk about an approach which is like, you know, when people do their nerdle or wordle for the day, every day they solve something. Similarly, I think organizations can push forward a security question, a security trivia every day to sensitize organizations about the issues, how to resolve the issues but do it in a manner and a fashion which is fun. Gamify it, make it immersive. That's how you're over a period of time, you will be able to etch a security mindset in the organizational DNA. Another very important aspect of awareness and training is measurement. Do we effectively measure how our training is panning out? Here, I'm gonna share with you a point of view, which might sound controversial. I'm of the hunch that every organization will do the part that legally they are required to do. So they will put out a training program, you complete the training, you sign off, and then if something were to go wrong and you are involved, they'll say, well, you did go through the training, you should have known it. And there is nothing wrong in that approach, but I would urge organizations to take, a, take it a step further. You know, come up with an assessment system which allows you to gauge how the training is enhancing a person's ability to do better in securing their environment in the context of their job. And this is going beyond being able to detect phishing attack. That is just one thing. And phishing is very important because that's a huge threat. But we have to take it role by role. I'm a, you know, I play a certain role at the University of Georgia. I'd love to know what are the do's and don'ts from a security standpoint while I operate. I want that customized, clear communication backed by training, backed by assessment. So I have a sense that yes, I'm doing these training programs every six months, and I can see that my knowledge is evolving. Finally, as with anything in an organization, if you want to institutionalize it, if you want to embed it in the work processes, you have to find a way of rewarding it. And how do you reward it? Make it part of an employee's performance review. Come up with an innovative way of capturing and recognizing an employee's contribution in terms of getting trained or training or anything else that suggests that they really have a commitment towards helping an organization secure their environment. I'll pause here, uh, Elliot. Well, there's a lot of amazing points here that we can definitely get get into further. And I, I do want to remind the audience, uh, just the, so Dr. Chatterjee is completely objective here. Uh, we have Hawks Hunt happens to be an awareness and training platform, but uh, we have Dr. Chatterjee is not being paid by Hawks Hunt whatsoever. And uh, also, this program is typically vendor agnostic. 
except for there are times where it just is germane to the conversation to talk a little bit about like what Hox Hunt does and to get into awareness and training more. And so I'm just curious here, uh, Dr. Shatterjee, these are all, so being customized, being personalized, engaging, and, and doing all these things that, and being able to reward uh, people who are engaged in the, in the training itself. Have you seen ways to actually scale that for large organizations, be it the university, be it at the government level, be it at you know, large enterprise level? So, uh, Elliot, let me answer your question in a couple of ways. There is a lot of excellent training available that focuses on the preparedness aspect. You know, I call this the low hanging fruit. I am not aware, and that doesn't mean it's not there. So pardon me, folks, if you are aware of programs that do a great job of the factors associated with the commitment dimension and the discipline dimension. Um, but, but again, going back to the holistic approach, how do you train people? Here are the, here are the good examples. We have read stories, unfortunate stories of how large organizations got breached because they did not promptly act on the intelligence they received, which I'm really appalled when I read that. Why would you hire external service providers to provide intelligence if you don't have a proper system, a proper mechanism to document and to act on them? Unfortunately, that's a weakness. There is a lot of tools that's constantly scanning the environment, doing a variety of good things to pick up on alerts. But the step, next step is, what are you doing with it? How good is your response? Are you documenting the rationale for your response, whether you decide to act or decide not to act? That's where I think the training program has to evolve and help develop that mindset. To give another example, you know, communication, transparency, huge problem. Every company has their own style. Yes, they are influenced by regulation, so they will do what, what the law tells them. But I would encourage organizations to be highly transparent with their stakeholders whether it's their shareholders, whether it's their employees, whether it's their customers, provide them with an update of how the company is approaching security, what steps they are taking, where they are. And again, I'm not asking you to reveal everything and I don't, but there are ways of communicating, people, pe keeping people posted, informed on a regular basis. So communicating effectively with clarity, with sincerity, with honesty, we also got to remind people of doing that through training. So, so, and then there are many more, I can just go on and on. Um, let's take another example, empowerment of the CISO. It's not good enough to hire a CISO and, and tell the world, okay, we have a CISO, we mean business, CISO has oversight, CISO is empowered. Let's ask the fundamental question, how objective is the CISO function? How fearless can the CISO and, his, and, and their team be to inform, say, an external audit committee, give them their honest opinion of the state of cybersecurity readiness in the organization? In fact, I'll again refer to another, another of my podcast episodes. I had the pleasure of having uh, Vishal Salvi, the global CISO of Infosys. And Vishal was, Vishal was very emphatic. He said, Dr. Chatterjee, I feel CISO should report directly to the CEO. Now that would be a huge change. Once again, you can address those aspects by enhancing the level of awareness of the senior leadership. So training has to go beyond tactical training at a junior level. Training has to be a lot more pervasive and influence all aspects of an organizational hierarchy. 
That's a hugely important point there. And one of the really interesting things about training is that, is that when it's actually fun and interesting, rather than training being some kind of a repulsive force, as it often is uh, when it's done poorly in that kind of drab, mo almost malicious way where you're trying to catch people and punish them, you can actually create these communication highways between the CISO across the organization directly into leadership. And I think that's a great point is that one of the great ways to communicate the value of cybersecurity and one of the great ways to bring people into it, this kind of shared responsibility as you're describing here in this, in this, uh, in, in this scheme is to give them good awareness, is to make awareness something that they can find relevant and I think it's a great point. And I would follow up the way you're, you're bringing that with uh, getting leadership involved through awareness. What is your research showing you? What are your surveys and what are your conversations showing you? Is it working? Has it worked in the past? Is it, is it not working? Is, what's, what's sort of the state of awareness and training now on risk, on outcomes, on, and we'll get into what this means, but on culture? So, uh, sorry, that's a big question. I asked you like a couple there in one sentence, but is it working? What's your research showing you? Um, so, Elliot, let me ap approach it this way. I'm going to focus on training and awareness when it comes to the senior leadership, because I think that's a very important area. And I don't believe we are making a lot of headway there from, from the standpoint of offering customized training programs. Um, I have anecdotal evidence to suggest that in many organizations, the leadership is very involved, very engaged, and very proactive. That's fantastic. But I also have anecdotal evidence to suggest that leadership is reactive. As I said, one of the podcast guests, you know, that was her, her finding from her experiences. So the the jury is out there in terms of what's working, what's not working. Once again, you can achieve a lot, lot of low hanging fruit goals here, but recognize that it's not an easy ask. It takes time. But if you are taking a comprehensive meticulous approach and you're plugging away, that's why I said training has to be continuous, has to be incremental over a period of time, you will see results. What generally happens, they will run phishing tests, then they will identify people who need help, they will train, then they will run phishing tests, and then say, okay, the percentage of people who were compromised has reduced, so the training is paying off. And again, I understand that, but that's not good enough. There is much more that has to be done and it has to be done in a different way. Like how would you train CISO? I mean, the senior leadership team, train. you train them by providing interactive scenarios. What happens if your organization experienced this kind of an attack and that led to these outcomes? How would you deal with it? There are simulations out there that are reasonable, but we can do even better. So not to suggest good things are not happening, not to suggest training is not being effective, but the message here is we need to do a lot more. Absolutely. There's a, a long ways to go. And uh, just to, to put in some of our own things that I've seen talking to different people is that if you take a better approach, if you take an approach that's relevant, that's positive, uh, it can have really incredible results and it can really just, uh, you know, not just risk, but just on, on be able to, to draw the C-suite closer to you as the CISO. And, and I think that's, uh, that, that can't be a more critical point that you're putting here, um, out on this point. And, and I think that that's, that's something that I want to get into now about the way that your book is structured is you begin with a series of case studies and that's, that's a bit different than how I think some people might have imagined a book by someone uh, with a doctorate who is researching this topic and might have expected a very, uh, as I said in the, in the introduction, kind of a stuffy scholarly tomb, uh, some kind of a textbook. 
you take this and you seem to uh, appreciate that cybersecurity itself is a very dynamic field. The threat landscape is constantly changing. The regulatory landscape is constantly changing. The solutions are constantly changing. So you lo- you somehow were able to dive into actual case studies. And I'm curious uh, why you did it that way and if there are any kind of unifying themes between the case studies that you begin your book with. So let me begin with the last part of your questions first. So you are correct that I did my research. I researched um, the literature. I was able to talk to a lot of the right kind of people. I fortunately I have great access and I got a lot of good, good insights. And the findings have been based on review of large scale breaches between 2013 and 2019 or 2020. Gross negligence, lack of transparency, inadequate preparation, poor communication. These are the four, if I could generalize the weaknesses and shortcomings. And I have a list here for your participants to look at. I don't want to read off the list, but I'm just (laughs) surprised when I read that how the hackers were able to access systems where the usernames and passwords were not encrypted, unencrypted customer data was was being stored in multiple locations, multi-factor authentication was not in place. Worse still, first, if you don't do your part, if you're not doing due diligence, if you're not being prepared, then the least you can do is inform the affected parties as soon as something happens. There is again, media reports out there where it took two attacks for certain organizations to share with the victims the nature of the attack and how they could be affected. So that's where the transparency comes in. So these are all concerning, but again, we have to be very, practical about it. It's not about, it's really about becoming cyber resilient. Nobody can guarantee that if you did all this, you will not be breached. That's not, that's not possible. But you can definitely, you means the organization can definitely do their part to recover quickly and well from a potential attack. If I was in the C-leadership team, And if I was running the organization, and if I was, let's say, responsible for the security aspect of the organization, one of the first things I would like to make sure, I'd be working very closely with legal and be made totally aware of what are the do's and don'ts and make sure we are checking those boxes and well, not just checking them, doing them substantively. Because because we generally as a company care. And so despite our best efforts, if we still get breached, though I'm not a lawyer, but I'd like to believe that I'd be able to make a strong case, my team and I, that we did everything possible. We are still doing it, but despite that, we got breached. Unfortunately, that's not the case many organizations have been able to make. So that's kind of the way I approach these things. And, you know, Elliot, as I mentioned to you during our planning session, as an academic, I've always felt very committed to practice. I'm a practice-focused academic. To me, research is not useful or is not satisfying if it doesn't inform practice. I've always been that way. My father, who is no more, He was a very, very distinguished practitioner. I hero worshipped him. My grandfather was a great scholar. I hero worshipped him as well. So I wanted to take the best of both the worlds and try to do as best as I can while I play this balancing act because academia does teach you you to be very rigorous. 
practice wants you to be able to share what makes sense. Yeah, I understand the reasoning, but so what? How can we act on them? And I'm very conscious of that. So whenever I'm writing something, I'm asking myself, the reader is going to ask the question, so what? Who cares? Why? And I should be able to address that. Otherwise, I'm wasting a reader's time. That's how my mind works for good or bad. Well, what an amazing field this is for someone to actually have applied research. Uh, it, it's an area where it's, it's really needed. There, there seems to be a lot of siloed uh, knowledge silos. There's not necessarily, uh, there are some commonly accepted frameworks and those have been developed through tremendous research and tremendous uh, effort. But, but even so, I think there really is a, a need for people like yourself, for academics like yourself, to take a real hands-on approach where you are actually getting into the field itself in order to uh, create knowledge and insight into this and also to be able to find a way to apply your research. So, uh, so you know, well done on that. And, and if I may, as I'm, as I'm looking at this slide here and we're looking at all the different uh, things that have happened, these unifying elements of these breaches, they, uh, I'm not sure if I'm speaking out of turn, but they all seem to have some kind of a human element. There seems to be something that has to do with the people. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a really good, um, that's, that, that's something that just seems to be pretty established now. The Verizon DBI report, I think their most recent number was 83% of breaches contained the human element. Uh, most, but not all of those are email. It can be, a lot of them are, are exactly what you're describing here. Networks not adequately segmented, uh, MFA not in place, and, and all these different elements. So it's, um, it's, it's really interesting to see this all uh, listed out like this. And what I wonder is that in your book, you, you go from your, your case studies and then you launch right into uh, culture. And I found that really interesting. And I'd love to hear you talk. I'm, I'm imagining that that was deliberate. So I'm, I'm curious to hear why you went from this type of uh, deep dive into the case studies and what went wrong with these breaches. And then you went into uh, culture. Yeah, and, and, and you know, that's a great question. Thank you for that. You know, it's like a, it's, it's, it's like a doctor who's trying, trying, to, trying to diagnose what the problem is. So first you mm -hmm. understand what the problems are, what the symptoms are, and then you want to reflect and find out what could be causing these problems. And you have to go beyond the symptoms. It has to be a deep dive. And what better deep dive than looking at culture. And I know culture is a very abstract term. You put the word culture out there and people will turn away and say, oh, it's too abstract. We can't, can't get our arms around it. Must be a professor. It's too academic. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually the, the, the real issue is, yes, it is abstract, but that's where the solution lies. How can you translate that into actionable items? So what I strive to do here in this book was how can you make or how can you create and sustain a high performance information security culture? What does that mean? And that's how the dimensions evolved. Commitment, preparedness, and discipline. Those are the three dimensions of a high performance information security culture. So in other words, there are 17 success factors that came from my work that I associate with creating and sustaining a high performance information security culture. And that reveals another very important thing. And that is, it is not easy to be on top of those 17 success factors. There's a reason why security is tough as a very tough ask. I don't envy the job of the security professionals I have great respect and regard for them. And that was partly why I was motivated to do my part because they are doing an awesome job. In many ways, it's a thankless job, but their necks are on the line. When something goes wrong, their heads roll, mm -hmm. though the problem is probably way deeper. And that's why it is important. And I didn't want, I think you'll find that I was able to summarize that chapter on culture in a few pages. I didn't want to go on and on. There are mm -hmm. hundreds of 
you know, are at least hundreds of articles on, on that topic in itself. But I wanted to get to the point, and that point is what? How do we create and sustain a high-performance information security culture? And another of my motivations came from the, the culture that prevails in the U.S. nuclear naval program, the submarine program. I read an article yeah. quite a few years ago where they talked about what the program did to try and ensure that there were no mishaps because one mistake would have catastrophic consequences. And I said, well, this is a good reference to use or to emulate and see how far a regular organization can go to create that kind of a high performance information security culture. You know, you brought up something uh, once just now, once earlier about the fact that when there is some kind of a breach, um, the executives are made to answer. And, and I think you, and I think you said both, uh, whether it's the board and the CEO, along with the, the CISO and the security team. But that seems to be two things. Number one, I think that no one's going to claim that it's ever going to be possible to have 100% protection. You know, it, it's, it's a matter of when, not if you're, you're going to get hit and you're going to get breached. And so the question is, can you lower the risk of that as much as possible by putting these things in place? And what I, what I understood from your book and from our conversation now is that establishing a strong security culture, that is what's going to educate people to build this, this whole uh, set of instincts and habits into everybody from the leadership down where they're not going to do dumb mistakes that create like multi-million or billion dollar uh, problems. Uh, and, and so I think that that's uh, a really important point. And I'm also wondering if you're seeing that there is more of a sense of urgency from the board and from the CEO level who are now through uh, more, either they've already been implemented or they will be implemented so uh, soon, new regulations, uh, new regulations from the White House down about how who's, supposed to take responsibility for a breach. So I'm wondering if now people are seeing more and more, if leadership is seeing that it's a business risk, it's not an IT risk, it's a business responsibility, it's not just an IT responsibility. Because that, that seems foundational to establishing culture in a business or organizational setting, is that sense of shared responsibility. So I kind of, I pose that more as a statement than a question, but, but I do want to ask you is if you're seeing more of a, a sense of of leadership accepting this is their responsibility as well? Another great question. I totally agree with your assessment, with your statement. So let me add a few things to what you already said. First, motivation drives human behavior. What's the best motivator? The jury is out on that. I'm sure there is good research. But I've had the pleasure of discussing this with many, many, many practitioners over multiple generations. And a consensus has been fear, unfortunately, is the best motivator. Fear from the standpoint of legislative action, fear from the standpoint of financial consequences, fear from the standpoint of business disruption. That's what motivates leadership to be proactive because their jobs are on the line. If the company doesn't exist, they, don't, they go away. So that's one reality. And we saw that reality in action when SOX was implemented after the Enron fiasco. Hmm. I have a hunch, and I hope my hunch is not true, that there, there will be a major security fiasco which will ultimately provide the impetus and the drive hmm. for a SOX-like legislation to come down the pipe. When I was doing my research on the various legislations which have been proposed or drafted, most of them have been shot down. I didn't get the time to get into the, all the details of that, but bottom line, Security is a complicated issue. There are various interests involved. 
So people want to be careful of what gets passed, what doesn't get passed. But the unfortunate reality is unless there is a strong motivation backed by punitive action, legal action, you're not going to get the desired change in behavior or change in mindset. But having said that, I also want to be fair to the leadership who have to run operations. They are constantly under stress to meet Wall Street numbers, let's say, and yet find time for security, provide oversight. So it's a challenge. It's uh, easier said than done that, hey, you guys need to be more involved, more engaged. And the person is going to say, so what else am I supposed to do? Am I going to be the CISO, the CFO, the CMO? Can I, I cannot be everything, and which is, which is very, very true. So that's where they have to find a way, a mechanism, whereby they are constantly briefed and they can swing into action when needed or as needed. So that is the challenge. It means this is something that we are discussing. If, if there were easy solutions, we would not have this discussion. We would have resolved it. This epidemic is not going away. It's here to stay. The goal is how do we deal with it as effectively as possible? That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you said it earlier, I think one of the best ways of, of presenting this dilemma. So that was an excellent response. I appreciate that. And, and you said something to the effect of you, you approach us as a doctor, find the symptoms. I mean, really, this is one of those things. No one's ever going to be 100% healthy forever. There's always going to be some kind of a problem. And somehow being able to treat this whole, uh, you know, treat each disease as it comes, but also take preventive actions to make sure that you don't uh, get sick for, you know, from just stop smoking, you know, do things that are actually going to lower your risk of getting a really bad disease. So yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, the answer that you have here and appreciate your time here. So we're, we're starting to run out of time. So if there is anybody who wants to ask a question, I encourage you to do so. Uh, but as we're, as we're kind of winding down here, we sort of, uh, we uh, maybe would turn the uh, order of the topics here on the head a little bit for what we planned. But Maybe you want to stop and uh, and finish off here. Is what is the threat landscape now? You you have a lot of research in how companies and organizations are responding to the threats. What are you seeing now? What is your research turning up uh, the state of the the state of the cybersecurity landscape in general? What are you seeing? Sure. So let me uh, pull up a relevant slide here, so I I can appropriately address it. Thanks. So the reality of it, folks, is that the more digitized we get, the more mobile our work environment becomes, the more we use smart devices, IoT devices, we become even more vulnerable. There's a price that we pay for convenience. There is a price that we pay for digitization. So it's not surprising that the hacker community, the hacker organizations, by the way, that's a very sophisticated and well-established industry. I had the mm -hmm. pleasure of speaking with somebody who, whose company does research on that industry, keeps track of what goes on in the dark web. And she was sharing some insights which were very, very concerning. They are very well mm -hmm. equipped, very well resourced. So trying to fight a battle against an enemy that is that is whose focus is to breach you, whereas your focus is to run your organization, that's where the disconnect lies. That's where the challenge lies. So as we speak, there is some hacker somewhere in the world coming up with an even better technique, even better mechanism. The last time I checked, the five top attack vectors were phishing, ransomware, IoT attacks, insider threats, and artificial intelligence enabled attacks. The one interesting example that comes to mind that I talk about in the book is about this chairman of a company whose voice was cloned 
to get money transferred to the hacker's account. I, I, I talk about it in the book. So that's like a, mm -hmm. you know, AI driven phishing attack. Boy, what a future. What a future yeah. we have and, ahead of us. And yeah, that's kind of, that's the part is, you know, as we speak, something else is coming up and then we have to constantly, so you have to constantly adapt. There is no respite. Exactly. You have to constantly stay on top of things. And you said this earlier, very appropriately, that the human vulnerability is significant and the hackers get that. That's why 99% of the attacks are focused on exploiting human vulnerabilities. So anything that we can do to reduce this, and that's where training and awareness is so important. And that's where I have been very upfront about this in all my talks, where I encourage the academic community, their universities, to just not offer specialized cybersecurity certificates, cybersecurity programs, but also to offer a class maybe as a core class in both the undergraduate and the graduate curriculum. So when students graduate, they have some level of understanding of cybersecurity readiness, some level of understanding. Just like in our university, we are big on enhancing data literacy. I'm also very big on enhancing information security literacy. That's a great point. Because one of the things that we see, I, I remember in the late 90s, uh, education, higher education, I guess secondary also, just started requiring students to become computer literate. And, and that's, you can't even imagine uh, the world now without that, where, where kids are, you know, as early as, as eight years old, 10 years old are coding, you know, it's in some schools. Um, and yet, people are information security illiterate and i find that to be surprising still i don't know how much longer that's going to be the case but the fact that people do basically log on every day into this very hostile environment with virtually no educational protection uh i think that that's it's good for you for uh for trying to advance that kind of a uh that kind of thinking and that that kind of approach to education Great. Well, Dr. Chatterjee, I think that I have exhausted our hour together here. I really appreciated this. This was fantastic. I appreciated you coming here so prepared as uh, I should have expected it, seeing as you are such a, uh, a prepared academic, but uh, this has been fantastic. You went above and beyond, and it was a pleasure having you here. Is there any final things? And I, I before we say... Everyone, again, uh, come to the website. We'll be giving you a link to where you can purchase Dr. Dave Chatterjee's book, Cybersecurity Readiness, and you can do so at a discount. And I really do recommend everyone to uh, check out this book. It's a great resource. Okay, any final thoughts? Did I miss anything? Was there any final uh, points you wanted to cover? Well, I, I would like to once again thank you, your organization, the attendees, for the opportunity to share my thoughts and ideas. You are very kind and gracious to call me an expert, but I don't think I'm an expert. I just know a few things, but I thought it was very important to put it out there because we can all do with a lot of help. And I hope that whatever I have shared, and if people choose to read the book, they find things of value that they can use to do their part in making us a relatively more secure environment. And when I say us, I look at it in a much bigger way. We are a global community. We must approach security as one global entity. And so we have to come together to be able to do that. And I've tried to play a small part in helping push things in that direction. So thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. That's beautifully said. Uh, it's absolutely true. Cybersecurity, the the knowledge that we have of this, we can take this home and share it with our parents, with our friends and loved ones. We can help everybody stay secure, protect them from 
some some really disastrous outcomes. And uh, I think that's really beautifully said, as you just did. So it's been a pleasure having you here, Dr. Chatterjee, and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thank you again for the opportunity. Have a great day. You too.